Hello, Van Tox. So, our next speaker, Tyrese Nicewander. So, Tyrese and I met about eight years ago through the Computer Human Interaction Forum of Oregon. Since then, it has been a wild ride. Um, I could not be more honored and impressed um, to be here today introducing her. I mean, she, she does it all. She is a VP of operations, helping uh, small businesses navigate the federal contracting space. Um, she, uh, she has been a speaker in front of the European Leadership Program multiple times. And for tonight, she's gonna be sharing a bit of the magic that she has experienced and learned how to navigate in uh, going to over 30 countries, finding citizenship at times in three places, and she's working on her fourth place right here in the United States of America. So she is bringing that to the stage. So without further ado, Tyrese Nicewander. Now I know what you're thinking. What has geographical arbitrage got to do with my person and my, my passion and my purpose? My passion is travel. My purpose is helping people. Anybody that knows me knows that all I live to do is to help people. If you need anything, I'm your girl. But that's not always been the case. And so what I want to tell you is, first, I want to define for you what geographical arbitrage actually is. Then I want to tell you how I came across it. But first, I want to tell you exactly what I went through in my life. Because there are certain things that you need to understand in, un in order to understand the determination that brought me to this particular stage. So geographical arbitrage is a very simple idea that has been around for centuries. It's not something that's new or that I've invented. I wish I did, but I didn't. And I want you to understand it's simple as just paying less for something else in another country. What does that mean? Less for housing, less for your cell phone, less for your health care. Building a circle of friends who are just like you, traveling around the world. Having access to amazing food. Exercising more because you, now you're exploring every city that you're in. And then chasing the sun and forgetting old man winter. I was able to avoid old man win winter for two and a half years. And then when I come back here, I come back to what? 11 inches, people. What happened? <laughs> what happened? I mean, I go away for two and a half years, and I, all of a sudden you've got 11 inches of snow? Please, I don't need it. <laughs> so to begin with, I, now I, the reason I don't like winter in the first place is because I was born at the beach, literally. Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, in East Africa is where I, where I am from. And at the age of four, my family fled as refugees to Munich, to Germany. And while we were there, my dad would pile us all into the Volkswagen and put us, and put us on a trail to any country that he thought was fit for that weekend to go travel in. So he always told us we are all the same, regardless of language, culture, and skin color. We are all the same. And that is a very important point. Because when we go traveling, we think to ourselves, oh, we can't go there because it's this or that or the other thing. But I want you to understand that this is an important factor into why I love to travel. It's because even though we are the same, we are able to learn from each other all the different things that we can experience. So. I got to Vancouver, British Columbia at the age of eight and living a very charmed life. Nothing out of the ordinary is happening. But then, in 1986, I was given six months to live. And I can't tell you how difficult that was because the year prior, my high school went on our graduation year to Europe and we traveled to five countries, we had a grand time, and I told myself at that moment, 
I'm going to make this my life. I'm going to get on a plane every year, and I'm going to see the world. And it's going to be my mantra to say that I have things to do and people to see. But when I was given that six months, I thought, you know what, universe? And I talk to universe a lot, by the way. Um, you can call him your God. You can call him whatever you want. But I call it my universe. And I told the universe, look, you can't show me all this and then take it all away from me. It's not fair. But clearly, the universe listened to me, and I'm here. I'm 56 years old. My birthday was last week. Happy birthday to me. <laughs> and... Then in 2007, once again, the universe looked at me, and I guess I wasn't following my passion, and, I, and gave me a little kick in the pants and said, hey, you need to pay attention because you haven't been following your passion. And in 2007, literally, again, I almost died on an operating table. And once again, I survived. Then in 2009, I thought I was getting married to the love of my life, and I moved to the United States just to find out that I had to run away from him two and a half years later, pay for my own divorce, pay for my own immigration, and I'm here on my own standing in the United States. I was not sponsored by a single person. I took responsibility for myself, and I told myself that I have no family here in the United States, that's my blood. But I have family that is like my friends, like my friend Robert, who introduced me. I have connections here. So I, that's why I decided to stay and not go back to Canada. Now, fast forward to 2016, I moved to Vancouver, Washington. And, and I really enjoyed it very much until I got the diagnosis of breast cancer. Oh, hey, universe, I think you've overshot the mark. I, yeah, how, three times? I'm, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cat with nine lives. I'm a woman. You need to give me a break. Luckily, it was caught at stage zero, but it was such a, um, a wake-up call really then to me because I thought to myself, okay, now, now I really have to get with the program. I have not been traveling like I said I would. I have not been doing any of the things that I set out to do when I was 19 years old. I, I still hadn't really captured what I needed. So then I, um, I got my phone out, started scrolling, and sure enough, what do you know? I see Remote Year. Remote Year was like this really beautiful company that was going to teach me how, actually, they were going to take care of everything. They were going to take care of all the logistics and all the traveling to these 12 countries, one country per month. All you needed was a big bag of money <laughs> and a remote job. And in 2016, I was firmly tethered to a desk. There was no way that I was going <laughs> to get this at any point. But because I was sitting there in that radiation chair and my debt was skyrocketing because I was one month short of the disability payments that I needed, so I had no income for seven months during my cancer treatments, that my debt was sky high. And then I went, okay, universe, you need to give me a year that I can do this, because I really want to do this. And if I'm going to survive, I want to know what that is going to look like. So I waited. And back came 2020. In 2016, I had no idea that 2020 was going to be such a year. So <clears throat> off I go to Chile. I'm there for two weeks, and the third week, I'm in lockdown, and then the fourth week, March 20, 2020, I'm back in the United States, but I can't come back because I don't have an apartment. Everything's in storage. I don't have anywhere to go because I have no family in the United States, and I can't be outside the United States because the United States basically said, you will be locked out indefinitely if you decide to stay out. So then I called my old buddy, Dr. Delphine Harris at the University of Alabama. She was my, she was one of my employers who really became my family when I lived there. And she didn't hesitate for one second and she took me in. And then I told her, I look, this is 
gonna, I don't know what this is. I don't know how long this is gonna be. I can't be here forever. So Mar May 1st, I decided to move to San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> San Antonio, Texas is beautiful. But in June of 2020, things started to get really rough. My apartment was a few steps away from the Alamo. All the riots, all the marching, the shootings, all of this stuff was happening. And it was starting to really get into my head and into my peace of mind. I was being robbed of going anywhere because I was petrified. And so I called the Canadian Embassy and I said, okay, that's it, you know what, I'm done. I, I don't, I don't want to be in the United States. I, I, I just can't take it anymore. You've got to tell me what I, what, what I need to do. And they said, you know what, you don't have to give up anything. You can just go to Montreal, wait it out for six months, it's all going to be fine. So I get across the border and I see this cartoon from Patrick Corrigan at the Toronto Star. Without exaggeration, this is exactly how I felt. <laughs> I felt so relieved. I felt so relieved and I thought, why? this is terrible that I feel relieved. I should be able to drag all my friends with me across the border. But I was not able to do that. They were stuck. So here I am sitting in Mo Montreal, Canada, and then I decided, okay, I need to do some research and figure out some things. And so while I was sitting there doing the research, I came across the Global Peace Index. And that's when I realized my fear and the actual violence and the loss of peace of mind that I felt was real. Canada sits at number 12 out of 163. United States sits at 129. So when people tell me that they're fearful of traveling abroad, I always say to them, really? There's 128 countries safer than yours. <laughs> I, honestly, I mean, fear of the unknown can be resolved simply by looking at information. So with that, I decided I'm going to go to Merida, Mexico, and I had started my journey, and I decided I'm just going to go traveling because I couldn't come back to the United States. And all I had to do really as a permanent resident was step into the United States for a week and then step out and then step in and step out every six months. That's it. And I was able to do that. So I went from Merida, Mexico, then went to Sarandi, Albania. Thank God. Um, Airbnb has this little thing that you can put into the search bar, less than $500 a, a month. And this place came up. And I thought, ooh, I need to go there. So that's why I went there. And then I went to Corfu, Greece. And then I went to Paris to see some friends. Then I went to the... Um, present at the European Leadership Program at the same time, and then I went to Spain. And then I came back to Merida, Mexico. And that's when I realized, hold on, I just started crushing my debt. How did I do that? I was paying less for housing, less for my phone, less for, less for my phone, less for every single thing. But the real, the real thing that I was saving on federal tax. <laughs> Foreign earning and exclusion. If you are out of the country for 330 days, you pay no federal tax. And if you read that last line down there, it actually says that the government doesn't want you to have the burden of paying tax. They want to encourage you to work and live abroad. So why aren't you all going out there, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> really. <laughs> Geographical arbitrage previously was only available to those who had the money because previously globalization was out of our reach. Now we can go to any part of the world that we want to, right? So this was one thing, but here's really why I care. Because 80% of women are more likely than men over the age of 65 to be in poverty. Why is that? Three reasons. First reason, we live too long. Second reason, wage pay gap. This is a real thing. We are paid less than men across the board. 
we would like to think that this is something that doesn't exist, but it does. In fact, the um, United Nations had a stat on this, and they said it's going to take till two, 247 years for it to equalize. Well, ah, universe, I don't want to live that long. But here's the real reason. In 2033, now this stat I pulled on Monday. Previously, it was 234. That Social Security benefits will pay out 100% only till 2033. And then you will get less than 77%. So if you were counting on Social Security to get you through your retirement, I think not. What I want you to understand is that geographical arbitrage is going to get you out of your financial prison. <clears throat> the financial prison is student loans, mortgage payments, whatever it is. You can actually save money because now you have paid less for everything. And then on top of that, if you really pl play your cards well and you plan and you research and you actually take the time to look at all the different places that you actually want to go, you can take geographical arbitrage to an entirely different level and put thousands of dollars into your retirement. Are you in for that? Are you? Because if you are, I, I can tell you one thing. Anybody in this room can harness this and really live a carefree life. A better life is waiting for you at the other side of fear because that's the only thing stopping you from actually traveling the world. So I want you to really think about this for a second. Take my story, take the fact that I have gone through all this craziness in my life, and I, and I kid you not, I am going to start traveling. So if anybody, anybody wants to find me, they can find me at tyrese.com, selfish plug. And I will teach you if you don't already know how to. But I will teach each and every one of you how to do this because each and every one of you deserves to have the key to get out of your financial prison. Thank you.